so if I'm remembering it correctly, it was my fifth day after my first encounter with the Sheik of Kafik's daughter. I was sitting in the bathhouse completely naked when, uh, uh excuse me? Um, what? Oh, oh, um, my liege. Uh, what, 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 what? My stories are so bad that you're going to imprison me? That, that's absurd. Uh, I, listen, listen, listen. I just need one chance to tell you the greatest story I, the world famous hunter, know. The greatest story I know. Have you ever heard of the land of Georgia? The Georgian people are known for their wine, for the legend of Jason and the Golden Fleece, and for their staunch support of Christianity. But at the time we're talking about, the great dynasty, Bagratoni, had not yet risen to power. This is the story of Count Bagrat Bagratoni of Cacetti, a man who lost everything when he was but a boy of 11, who retained minimal power and all but gave up on life when after years and years of trying, his wife was unable to give him a child. Yet, in his twilight years, he had a son, David. And with the birth of that son, he strove to change his destiny. So what should I say about myself? I was cheated as a boy. I was cheated out of the lands that were rightfully mine that I inherited from my father as he had inherited them from his father before him. For many years, I was in despair. I did nothing. The small county which I still retained control of was the center of my small and petty life. During those years, the attempts that my wife and I made to have a child all failed. Until 13 years ago, a miracle. And my son, David, was born. Now, it has become essential in a way that it never has been before that I find a new path so that I can create the foundation he needs to take back that which was once ours and should be his by right. Count Basrat's story is not really so much a story of revenge as it is a story of redemption. King Bagarat, coincidentally having the same name as him, King of Old Armenia, took the lands that were rightfully his father's when he was but a boy, 11 years old. Those lands are now held by his son, Prince Tornik. But that's not particularly Prince Tornik's fault. In truth, he had simply inherited the lands that the Abbasid Empire had left his father with when his father died, lands that had once belonged to Count Bagarat. Nonetheless, Count Bagarat knows that if he is to create an opportunity for his son, if he is to create any kind of lasting legacy for his house, Bragatoni, he is going to have to build up a power base for his son to use in retaking the lands which are his by birthright. Of course, the entire situation is made more complex by the fact that Prince Tornik is a part of Count Bagrat's dynasty. The Bagratuni are a cadet branch of House Bagratoni, which means that his plans for his son to be restored to his own territory will mean fighting against members of his own family, his own dynasty. Such dynasty wars are not normally preferable, but there is no other way. The fact is, it was his own family that had moved against his father and thus he has been left with no choice. 
if his son is to have restored to him that which belongs to him, and possibly to fulfill the great destiny of the house, he must prepare the way for a dynasty war in which his son, younger than him, a more powerful warrior than him, does that which he is no longer capable of in his old age, restore his family's lands, and restore the future of the house. So to begin with, he needs to find a way to create a strong county. We may as well start off by doing his council, uh, setting up court marriages, and beginning all the things that are innate to the start of any CK3 playthrough. Because his court is so small, it's going to be absolutely essential that we enforce and manage marriages of all of his council members. It's not something that we can neglect. It's also, I find, in a game like this one, where the intent is going to be a lot of role play, useful for establishing relationships and for giving jumping off points to create different kinds of dynamics in the court and in the game itself. Since when you're role playing, the more you know about the situation of your character, including the people that influence him or her, the more you will be able to make decisions that feel like part of a story. So this is his half-brother. His half-brother is an absolutely terrible steward. So we're going to immediately make him our spy master, which is a job he can actually do okay in. He has two nephews on his council. His steward and his chancellor. Of course, the problem is that neither one of them is very good at being a chancellor, and the one who is currently acting as his chancellor should actually be his marshal. It's difficult, though, because I don't want... <laughs> While Bagrat is a man who has had tons of problems with members of his family, and the harm they've done to him in the past. I think he still wants to keep a good relationship with his brother and his brother's children. The problem with that is that he can't do so at the detriment of managing his own diplomatic relations. Chancellor is a really important position when you are a weak person in a straw in a land filled with strong enemies. While most of his neighbors are Christians, a lot of them are not on his side. And the ones who aren't Christians are Abbasid Muslims who have no interest in him staying in power, which means he's going to need a stronger diplomat. I think in spite of the fact that he doesn't like the idea of removing his nephew, pragmatism is going to require him to do it. But before we commit to that, Let's arrange our marriages. It's possible we could find a way to bring in if we can find a way to bring in someone like a strong steward. Our biggest problem is that we only have one female courtier, which means we're not going to be able to bring in counselors and we're not going to be able to bring in warriors. And that's fine. To me, even in a role-play game, I do marry the court. It is absolutely essential that his knights and those people in positions of power in his court, those people who he supports the living of, return the favor by being in strong Christian marriages that will help to make sure that the next generation of his courtiers is strong and good. It doesn't make any sense to me that he would allow his knights to remain unmarried. And historically, lieges, lords, 
counts, people of significance did have a lot of influence even on their courtiers' marriages. In fact, sometimes knights could only get married and start a family with their permission. It makes perfect sense to me that a man in a position where he has a weak court and who is trying to establish himself for the future with very little that he could influence would definitely be trying to influence the marriages of the people in his court in order to assure that they create a more powerful foundation for the future he's trying to create. So ultimately, I can afford to have a bad steward more than I can afford to have a bad chancellor. So we're going to try to marry our singular uh, eligible woman courtier to one, unless we get lucky. If this guy, no. <laughs> No luck for us. Not only did our call for a mountain specialist not get us anyone that we can use on our council, but it also got us somebody who is just not a good warrior. He's an okay commander, I suppose. But I don't know how much we need those. Yes, ultimately, I think it's going to be necessary for us to fire our nephew as the chancellor, however much that is not what he would prefer and have Gachara here marry someone with some degree of diplomatic skill. Preferably someone with diplomatic skill and that can serve as a warrior. So this guy has the best diplomatic skill, but he's an atrocious warrior. I think I would rather take a 14 who can serve as a knight. Uh, nine isn't very good, but at least nine is minimally tolerable. And it's not like we have much choice in knights anyway. Nine is a lot better than most of the people we have in our army right now. So now we're going to marry all of the knights in the court for trait marriages and all of our counselors for trait marriages. Because like I said, we want to make sure that we create a, a strong next generation so our son has a better selection of people to, at least we want to influence it as much as we can. Just because we get them married doesn't mean they'll have children and doesn't mean those children will stay. But you have to use the influence you can. And that is the kind of pragmatism that I think really underlines where Bagrat is at this point in his life. When he was a younger man, he was angry, as shown by his background as subterfuge related. He didn't believe he was going to succeed at any of the things he wanted to in life and very much was simply in a retirement of self-indulgence, probably using his um, influence to keep his position long enough for him to finish living out his life but then 13 years ago his wife who had never cared bared any children for him bore any children for him had a son and that changed everything now this kid wants to be a steward but he's too old to get a guardian for and his stewardship is awful so there's really no chance that there there's no point in really putting any effort into this kid which is too bad. I don't mind using my influence to get good guardians for courtiers, for the children of courtiers, if they might prove useful, particularly Marshall or any positions on the council that I might have. Uh, this kid is very slightly better. He doesn't have all his traits yet. He's only 12 and he also wants to be a steward. So maybe we will find a guardian for him. Yeah. In fact, I think our best bet for finding an education for him is taking one of the wives that has just arrived for one of our men, making her our court tutor. Although this is going to cost a lot of money and we're going to need that money. But I mean, making her court physician and court tutor should be good. Her intelligence trait 
is going to mean that she will be a good tutor and hopefully she will learn the basics of medicine pretty quickly. More or less, unless somebody has an intensely high intelligence now, they are only a good doctor with the trait, so there's no point in uh, obsessing over the fact that your doctor starts poor. All right, so we will, in spite of the fact she's not very good at stewardship, she's good at all the other traits that a guardian needs, so we'll just hope that works out. We don't have a good steward, so it's not like we can do anything about it. And if our sponsorship of this young man doesn't turn out the way we want it to, we'll either find another use for him at our court, or, or we'll move on. So we fired our nephew. It sucks. But there's really not much else we can do about it. We have no other options. We cannot afford to not have a diplomat helping us to make sure that our neighbors, well, don't absolutely despise us. Since the defined purpose of Count Bagarat for the last years of his life is to improve the situation of his son, we're going to work on development and we're going to work on learning. Basically, we're going to try to prove to the patriarch that we are a good orthodox traditionalist that our small territory in the far off Caucasus mountains is important to support and we're going to do that by becoming better at learning and taking the traits that will give us baseline approval with him that come from learning so in that way, our reputation will become strong with the Patriarch, and our strong relationship with the Patriarch will mean that we can use him as a source of funds to develop our lands, and eventually to buy men-at-arms, which our son will inherit and be able to use in line with the education that we're providing him once we're dead. We're also probably going to pick up golden obligations. We're going to spend almost all of our spy master's time searching for secrets in the lands of our neighbors, especially in the lands of our enemy. Because if we can find secrets, then near the end of our life, once we have golden obligations, we will be able to use those secrets to make some cash to add to our son's inheritance. At least that's the hope. It may not work out. There may be no secrets to find. But if they exist, we will find them. Eventually, hopefully. We're not actually that good at it. <laughs> Neither us nor our spy master. In spite of the fact that I and my brother both think of uh, subterfuge as our primary strength, neither one of us is particularly strong in that area. One of the reasons I think that the Count has decided to support his son by becoming ingratiated to the Roman Empire and particularly the Patriarch is because he's probably aware of the fact that any other kind of moves he might make will be most likely to fail. So we're going to try to get the best alliance for our son possible. 13 is a good age, I think, for betrothal. Uh, Bagrat is pretty traditional, though, so he's definitely the kind of man who will betroth people, not even with the intent always to get them married, just with the intent of creating the um, alliance. But this actually looks like a good real marriage prospect. It's a strong alliance. Uh, I think, though, I would prefer to marry the younger daughter. If we can, yeah, her. It's a strong alliance with Greece. It fits with our idea of doubling down on our orthodox faith in order to get the support we need externally that we can't find internally or locally. 
and I think that it will make a good like future prospect for my son because it's the kind of alliance that it will be good for him to have continue over into his rule which is ideal hmm We have really no friends. <laughs> it's not surprising. So there's the alliance. Our son is now set up with a good marriage. Another one of the foundation points for his future hopes. It seems our dynasty is going down the... Whoops. The blood route, the trait route, which is fine by me. I probably wouldn't have picked it if I was in charge because it's a little gamey and it's not really the kinds of things he's interested in. Probably he would have picked something more war. Re oh, oh, I have typhoid. Okay, well, you know what? That's a good place to end. We've done all of our setup. And the poor old Count may just die before anything begins. That would be an extraordinarily ironic way for this to go. His son would begin in a terrible position with absolutely none of his father's strength supporting him and not even out of childhood. So my liege, what do you think of the story of Count Bagrat? I can stay. And not in the prison? You do want to hear more then? Excellent. And I'm even more glad to sleep in a bed and not on a stone floor tonight. <laughs>